So right now I'm with Cyrus, the Ethereum guy, <laughs> who's building a decentralized virtual world on Ethereum. So Cyrus, can you introduce yourself? My name is Cyrus Adkison. I built Etheria. I'm originally from uh, Kentucky in the United States. Um, I'm just a hacker enthusiast for blockchain technologies and virtual worlds. So what is Etheria? Etheria is a decentralized virtual world. It's a 33 by 33 map of hexagons, 457 of which are purchasable land tiles that can be farmed for uh, blocks, which are like Lego bricks. And then you can uh, place those around, build whatever you want, build a shack, build an animal, build a tree. Uh, you can color the, color the bricks and um, make whatever you want on your tile. Okay, so um, first, What's the advantage of building a virtual world on Ethereum? Well, it is, uh, the blockchain cannot be censored, it cannot be taken down by uh, government or by uh, malicious actors. It will always be there. And that really is a powerful uh, thing to think about, that the things I build on my tile will outlive me. Uh, that's kind of speaks for itself in terms of uh, importance and power. So essentially, what is the blockchain really storing? It is storing the state of each tile on Ethereum? Right. Well, it's storing the state of the entire map, in a way. Uh, it, it, it knows the elevation of each tile, whether it's below sea level or whether it's higher. Uh, and it goes from beach to grassland to hills to mountains. I thought about making some distinction between those types of lands, but really they're all the same. They, they just look different in my graphical representation, which by the way, because the state of the world is stored in the blockchain and the blockchain is open, anybody can build their own graphical interpretation of the world. I just happened to build my own so that people could see it. Um, what was the question? <laughs> so so what, is this, what is the blockchain really storing? Okay, it's, um, it's storing what, block, what uh, blocks you have and when I say blocks, I mean bricks, like Lego bricks. It's storing which blocks you have. There are, uh, I believe, 20 different types, maybe 18. So there's like the column that's eight high, there's the beam that's eight across, there's the stair step. Um, so there's 18 of those. So it, each brick is what type of tile it is, the X, Y, and Z of the key hex. So for the column, for instance, the key hex is the bottom one, and then there's seven on top of that. Uh, and then what color that block is. So it's really only five bytes of data per block. Mm -hmm. um, and then as you place your blocks, uh, the, the contract determines the rest of the occupation. So there's only five bytes in that one key hex for the column, the eight high column, and then the, the contract knows that the other seven on top of it are also occupied. Right, so it doesn't have to store as much data. It figures that out as it goes. What's the difference between a tile and a block? A tile is, imagine the map, and you got water, and you got land. Those are tiles. Mm -hmm. Blocks are the Lego bricks that you place on top of the tiles. Uh, so the tiles are like the world, and the blocks are components by which users can build something in the world. That's right. Can users buy and sell tiles? They can. And it's an interesting thought. When I, when I built the world the first time, I created this offer system where I own a tile and people can give me offers on that tile. They can offer me two ETH, three ETH, whatever. And the contract had to keep track of what offers were coming in. It had to allow the owner to accept an offer, reject an offer. It had to allow the person making the offer to um, retract it. It had to hold the value of the offer in the contract. And it got really complicated. And then it dawned on me one day that why not just provide one method that's, that, that could be called by the owner of the tile saying, give this tile to someone else. Mm -hmm. And then outside of Etheria, there could be a smart contract, some de a trustless contract that would allow that transaction to happen. So I just moved all that logic outside and it became way easier, way simpler. To, uh, to program. Yeah, that's like modular design, right? Like, so you have the contract which only stay, stores the owner of each tile, mm -hmm. and then the how the owner will be determined can be determined outside in our other, other contracts. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, so my fundamental question is why does a tile have value 
when Ethereum can be forked infinitely? Um, well, it's a network effect. If you fork Ethereum and no one else is using it, how much fun is that? If, if the original Ethereum has all 457 tiles sold, which it does not, go to ethereaworld.com uh, or ethereum.world to get them, um, then that's, that's more fun because you get to see what people are building next to you and um, yeah, it becomes a, a living world rather than just a fork that's some software that nobody uses. Okay, and who can create new tiles? I mean, can you create new land or new sea? Etheria is uh, static. I can superimpose other Etheria contracts on top of it and ask the user base to use this new contract. And they probably would because all I have to do is change the address in the how-to page and people would probably just do it. But the previous versions of Etheria will always continue to live on and they can choose to work in those worlds if they want to. Now, to answer your question, can more land be created? Yes, I could, I could redraw the map in, in future versions of Etheria. But I've decided that if I do that, which is really a question, I don't know if I will, that the ownership should never be diluted. If I create four times the number of tiles, I think the current owners should get four times as many tiles. Mm -hmm. Because I don't want to dilute them. I, I see them as investors in the early state of the game. Mm. Okay. I will never create new unowned land. And so, so you decided like like the power to create new land currently rests completely with you. Do you do you think that this would be distributed like you could have a token or something, and the owners of token could decide whether new land should be created or not? Well, in the in the new versions of Ethereum that I created, I. Um, I carried over ownership. So if you owned a tile in version 1.0, you own that tile in version 1.1. 1 .1. um, but like I said, it, it's, it's up to the users whether they want to stick with the old Ethereum or move to a new superimposed version that I created. Because they all live on forever. I can't take them down. Nobody can take them down. They're just going to be on the blockchain forever. So um, it's really up to the community whether they want to follow my superimpositions uh, heck, somebody else, you could create your own superimposition of Ethereum if you could get users to use it. Um, more power to you. And do you suppose that the future versions of Ethereum will all be on the Ethereum blockchain or will you use some other system to store the data and the Ethereum blockchain only to have hashes or state roots of Ethereum? Ethereum is really revolutionary and I found it very easy to use. Uh, the people who built Ethereum are just amazing. But a virtual world contains a lot of information. If, if technologies come along, maybe attached to Ethereum, uh, maybe aside from Ethereum, but I don't see that happening, uh, that could hold more data than I could, uh, I, was, I was pretty limited in what I could do with Ethereum when I built it, but if there were technologies that could hold more data, and maybe faster block times or things like that, I would be interested in that. But I don't see that happening. I mean, I think the Ethereum people are at the cutting edge of what is possible. Yeah, I, 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 didn't, I didn't mean the question to, um, to go in the direction of an alternative blockchain that competes with Ethereum, but rather, um, like there are many projects that are thinking of using IPFS as a data store, right. and then uh, hashing all the data into a Merkle root, and that goes into Ethereum. Mm -hmm. And uh, so you have two systems, one for handling big data and one for handling just the consensus on the data that you need. Mm -hmm. So do you think a future architecture would be like that? Well, the storage of data is a limiting factor, but really it's the processing of that data that became the more critical limiting factor. And IPFS doesn't solve that problem. So for instance, as you place blocks on your tile in Ethereum, uh, each subsequent block that you place has to check the previous blocks. And it, it does three checks. One, is the new block you're placing inside your tile? Two, does it conflict with any other tiles you've placed? And three, does it stack like it should, either on the ground or another block? After about 30 or 40 blocks, you start to run out of gas. 
the, it, because the 41st block has to go back through and check all the previous 40 to find out if there are any conflicts, whether they can stack, and et cetera. Um, IPFS wouldn't help in that sense because IPFS doesn't do any computation. It's just a storage vehicle. So I asked Vitalik uh, a little while ago why the gas limit is so low per block, and he says it has to do with um, if, if the gas limit were higher, you might have delays in block propagation. If you increased from pi million to say 10x of pi million, you might have block times that go from 17 seconds to 30 seconds or 40 seconds, and nobody wants that. So uh, then you run into um, consensus and uh, other, other issues pop up. I'm, I don't think on that level, but <laughs> I trust them that there are issues with it. So essentially, um, so essentially, okay, um, like some technology, did, are you aware of technologies for provable computation? I'm not. I'm sure people are working on that. Uh, yeah. I haven't seen it. Okay, cool. So um, what's the, what's the uh, linkage between Etheria and virtual reality? Is there a link? Well, I would love to explore Etheria with a virtual reality helmet on. Uh, my graphical representation that I built is just a OpenGL in the browser using 3JS. Uh, but if somebody built a world, maybe maybe even my graphical representation could be explored with a virtual reality helmet on. I would love to see that. What uh, what kinds of you things have people built in Ethereum? Um, building is challenging <laughs> in Ethereum. It's very it's all command line based. And you really, I mean, I, I find it easiest to get a piece of paper with a grid on it and start drawing what I'm, what I'm going to build. Um, I built a horse with a little fence around it. People might have seen that on Twitter. It had no head because I ran out of gas. Uh, someone else built a really cool log cabin that had uh, white, white bricks for smoke coming out of the top of the chimney. Um, in an earlier version of Ethereum, which unfortunately I had to get rid of, somebody had placed a couple of blocks around their tile. So people, people have experimented, but it is... It's not easy. It's not easy. Uh, one thing I've been thinking about is creating a builder where off-chain someone could go into Etheria, drag and drop blocks around, change the colors, and you know make it really easy for them. And then at the end of their editing session, it would just show them all the commands they need to execute to make that happen. Um, that's something I may develop in the future. OK. Um so does, Ethe does the world of Ethereum have any physics, and how, 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 how does it work? The only real physics is that blocks can't uh, occupy the same space, and that new blocks have to stack either on the ground or on other blocks. Um, <laughs> in I don't know if I should admit this, but later on in development, I realized that what you could do is place a block, place another one on top of it, and then just remove the one underneath. And the, and the second block would float in midair. Yeah. And I thought about how to fix that, and it, there's, it's kind of a hard computational problem, because what if you have a column, a beam, and another column, and then you take this column away? Well, this beam is still OK, because it's resting on this column. Doing that kind of computation inside the Ethereum blockchain would be uh, difficult, cost more gas, and I just decided to leave it as it was. So if people want to build floating structures, then you know, that's, that's on, on them. So in, in theory, like Ethereum could have physics, but physics would need a lot of computation, which needs a lot of gas, and that makes it impractical. That's right, for the most part. For the most part. So um, what, what features are you thinking of adding next? Well, when I first thought about Ethereum, um, I wanted it to be a game, and I had an idea to add a threat on the board. Or, or multiple threats, but uh, for instance, a barbarian that would go around from tile to tile and destroy stuff. And it would be on the tile owners to build defenses, walls or towers, cannons, whatever. And, but then you, then you reach the point of how good are the defenses that this person has built? How do you assess those defenses? Um, one way would be to do it computationally, again, uh, not really that practical. How, how could the blockchain or any computation you write on the blockchain determine how good of a wall somebody built or, or a cannon or whatever? 
Uh, the, uh, the other thing that crossed my mind was to, would be to do voting. Let tile owners vote on other tiles and assess them for how good they are. Maybe, maybe just up and down voting. Thumbs up, thumbs down. That looks like it has good defenses. Thumbs up, it doesn't. Thumbs down. Um, the problem with that is civil attacks. Someone could buy a bunch of different tiles under different names and or under different accounts, and then just upvote all their own tiles. They, they might not even have to place bricks at all to have really good defense scores. And I really couldn't think of a way around that. So in the end, I just left it as a vanity um, building game that seemed like the, the safest, most practical path to follow at this stage anyway. So um, are, are, you, are you thinking of really developing Etheria into a large virtual world, or is it like a hobby project? It was mostly a hobby project, an experiment. Um, I don't rule it out. If, if I have ideas, then I'll definitely pursue those. But for right now, I'm happy with this, the way it is, the state of it. And um, I hope people build some stuff in it more than they have. Um, but I think some technology development, the development I think some technology developments need to happen before it becomes a full-fledged, fun game to play. So, so finally, we'd like to uh, just uh, have your thoughts on the Fermi paradox and, uh, and virtual realities. So can you explain to us what is the Fermi paradox? OK, so the Fermi paradox says that there are billions of stars out there, and there are billions of planets uh, orbiting these stars, um, and yet, with all of that, you would think there'd be intelligent life, and we haven't heard any of it. How come we have not heard any alien species? One of the solutions to the Fermi paradox is that um, aliens have progressed in their advancement, technological advancement, past the real world, and it makes sense if you stop and think about it. The the awesomeness of the regular world is static over time. Yeah. I mean, it might fluctuate a little bit, but it's generally static. The virtual worlds are getting better and better and better, probably at an exponential rate. If you think into the future, if you're living in a virtual world, you're, you're going to be safer. Um, your experiences are going to be more amazing. You might be able to walk around on the surface of Pluto. Uh, all kinds of experiences would be incredible and less expensive. So if, if every advanced society eventually goes into virtual reality and gets rid of real reality and they stop caring about the outside world, maybe that's why we haven't heard from any alien species. Yeah, I mean, I mean, it's like, it's like we build cities and cities are so nice that we don't really care about the jungle anymore. Even, <laughs> that's right. even though we used to live in the jungle, maybe right. the aliens are living in their own city, which is a virtual city, right. and they don't care about the real universe anymore. I mean, virtual worlds are very powerful. I'm a recovering World of Warcraft addict, and I can tell you um, that for many people, the, their possessions, their friendships, their relationships, their goals uh, are more important to them in a virtual world than they are outside. And it gets really powerful when you stop and think about people can switch identities. Let's say that you're born um, physically disabled in the real world. Well, in World of Warcraft, uh, no one cares. All they care about is your utility to them in the game and how far you can help them progress or whether they like you as a friend or, or whatever. Uh, they don't care what kind of family you're built into, how much money you have. There's an equality to virtual worlds if you can change your identity. Um, it's really powerful, really powerful. It's not hard to understand how a lot of people choose to live in virtual worlds rather than the real one. Yeah. So where can our viewers discover more about Etheria? And build their first horse. Uh, I would say go to etheria.world. There's a couple of links there. One is uh, just my overview of what it is. Then there's the how-to page of how to get started building something. And then obviously the explorer, the map explorer. So you can see what I built and what other people have built. Cool. It was great chatting with you, Cyrus. Thank you. Appreciate it.